Ann Carter and I'm a project officer for the Freshwater Habitat Trust. So today I'm going to be delivering a training session on amphibian ID uh, and spawn survey. This is part of the Brex Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership project, Citizen Science Testing the Water. It's also in conjunction with the Freshwater Habitat Trust's national spawn survey campaign. So we'll mainly be focusing on frog and toad ID, but we'll also have a look at um, some of our other native amphibians, in particular uh, newts. A bit about Freshwater Habitats Trust. So we started life as Pond Action back in the late 1980s. And this is an organisation which subsequently became Pond Conservation. And that's with Jeremy Biggs and Penny Williams at the helm. In 2013, we relaunched a charity as a Freshwater Habitats Trust. And this was to spearhead the fight uh, against biodiversity loss in all of Britain's fresh waters. So not just for ponds, but for all small water bodies, including streams, rivers and ditches. We are very much an evidence-based conservation charity. We have a very strong science background. So we are, again, highly strategic. So we target our work where evidence suggests it will be effective. And we work in partnership with people, communities and organisations to get the best results for freshwater wildlife. So the uh, Brex, Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership <coughs> scheme is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and it's a new landscape partnership scheme which was set up to conserve and celebrate the unique heritage of the Norfolk and Suffolk Brex. The uh, scheme area. The scheme area is located on the borders of Norfolk, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire and includes three main river corridors. So we have the River Wizzy to the north, um, the Lark to the south and the Little Ooze in the middle. Five year delivery period, so that's between 2020 and 2024, working with partners and communities. The Brex Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership Scheme aims to deliver a minimum of 24 projects. Now we are leading on one of these, citizen science testing the water. The aim of testing the water is to get new information about the project area through surveys and to involve people in the collection of important biological and environmental data needed to protect life in fresh water. So in spring 2022, volunteers sampled water bodies using cutting edge eDNA kits to record vertebrate species in the Brex area. Now, as well as mammals, fish and birds, these kits also recorded amphibian species. Um, 71 um, sites altogether and 57 of those came back with results. So out of these, we actually detected five amphibian species in total. And the most commonly detected was the common toad, which was recorded at 19 sites, followed by common frog at 16, smooth newt at eight, Great Crested at three and Pool Stroke Marsh Frog at two. And in one study area, at Foulmere Lake, which was on the MOD estate, um, we detected four amphibian species altogether. So that, that on that particular site, we had common toad, common frog, smooth newt and great crested newt. Now, 50% of the sites recorded no amphibians. The, um, the, new, the, the amphibian that's left out here is a palmate newt, and this wasn't recorded at any of the sites. But this is actually in line with one, what, what one might expect, given that there are very few records of this native amphibian in the Brex area. Um, the Freshwater Habitats run a national spawn survey count campaign every spring, collecting records of frogs, toads uh, across the UK. We'd like to build on the results of the eDNA surveys to collect additional data in the Brex area. Now, of course, you can submit data from anywhere in the UK. It all builds to the bigger picture. But we'd like to encourage the good people of the Brex to, to especially keep an eye out for signs of frogs and toads in the BFER scheme area. Our 
started with an introduction to toads and frogs. The common toad will start by telling you a little bit about the common toad. Now, despite its name, the common toad is no longer as common as it once was. And toads are now considered at-risk species, protected by law for, for sale and trade. And they are now classed as a priority species for conservation. Toad numbers have reduced significantly over the last few decades. Although the reasons for this are not clear, road mortality, climate change and habitat loss could all be contributory factors. Toads can be found in a wide range of habitats, particularly open woodland, hedgerows, grassland and gardens. Toads are more tolerant of dry conditions than frogs and newts and can be found far from water outside of the breeding season, especially on heathland, moorland and on sea cliffs. They prefer to breed in lakes or gravel pits, but they will use parks or large garden ponds and occasionally uh, canals or slow flowing rivers. In fact, our BFER day, uh, eDNA survey found evidence of toads in quite a few of the rivers in the Brex. Because common toads are less prone to fish predation than common frogs, populations can exist in waters inhabited by fish. So common toads, co toads hibernate on land, often in old rodent burrows, which can uh, be some distance from the water. In the springtime, mi they migrate to their breeding ponds, often the ponds in which they were born. And this usually takes place after dark on damp evenings in March. This often results in many ro toads being killed by cars in areas where uh, road crosses their migration uh, route. And they congregate in their breeding uh, ponds in large numbers, with males often forming mating balls as they comp compete for females. Spawning takes place at night, and jet black tadpoles usually emerge from the eggs within two weeks. Moving on to the common frog. Uh, this is one of our most familiar and widespread amphibians. The common frog population and the wider countryside declined dramatically during the latter half of the 20th century, mainly due, due to agricultural intensification and the loss of farmland ponds. Garden ponds have been somewhat of a saviour for the species. Populations thrive in suburban and semi-rural residential areas where the species' um, powers of dispersal have helped to ensure its survival, with the newly constructed ponds often being quickly colonised. Frogs can be found in a large range of damp habitats, including woodland, damp grassland, hedgerows, moorland, parks, gardens and uplands, up to about a thousand metres. Whilst they typically breed in small, shallow ponds and the margins of larger lakes, common frogs also use ditches, puddles and slow flowing waters. They are opportunistic breeders, and unlike toads, they are not faithful to their birthplace. So common frogs tend to hibernate in damp conditions, either close to water or submerged in the mud at the bottom of the pond, absorbing enough oxygen through their skin to survive. They breed as soon as they emerge from hibernation, typically in late February or early March. Common frogs are often described as explosive breeders as they create quite a commotion in their breeding pond for a week or two, with many croaking males visible at the surface. However, as spawning is over, adult frogs quickly disperse, hence the scientific na name Temporia. Spawn is laid in the shallowest, sunniest parts of the pond and tadpoles emerge, emerge from it within two weeks. We'll now take a look at identifying toad, frog, toad, toad, toads, frogs and their spawn. Let's have a look first at uh, frog spawn, which tends to appear in the pond first. 
I'm sure that you're familiar with frog spawn, but to recap, frogs lay around um, round spawn clumps of up to 2,000 eggs, each black with lighter uh, patch underneath enclosed in a severe sphere of jelly, as you can see here. Many frogs spawn together, the individual clumps can form a single conjoined mat. As each individual frog will lay one clump, it's possible to estimate how many female frogs are breeding in the pond. So looking at this photo, it looks like there are three clumps, so three female breeding frogs. Example, obviously made a bit easier to count with rings around them. It takes a bit more time, but it's possible to determine the number of individual clumps. If you are able, it's actually worth taking a photograph like this and counting them up at home. But please be aware that when they are first laid, they are quite tight and then spread out with age. So it can be quite tricky to count them. Don't worry though, on the recording form, we ask that you count the clumps in batches. So for example, two to five, six to 10, 11 to 20, and so on, right up to 2001 plus. So we just want an idea really. So for this example, we can see 15 clumps. So this can be recorded as between 11 and 20. And I'll tell you more about the um, survey form later on. So she'll spawn that is starting to develop. So as you can see here, it'd be very difficult to count how many frogs have laid here. And you can see the little black, black specks are the um, the tadpoles start starting to, 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 to grow. And again, a little close up. So here, the little tadpoles have, have, have emerged from their um, sort of jelly, jelly sacks and are moving. Oh, here again, a bit more developed. Um, and as you can see that, you can see it's starting to develop nicely into a tadpole. So frog, um, so moving on to toad spawn. So toads lay spawn in strings, which are often wound around aquatic vegetation and have double alternating rows of black eggs. Each string on average contains about 1,500 eggs. But don't worry, for toad spawn, we only ask that you recall the presence because it's pretty impossible to count. And I think this is quite a good photograph, actually, because it does show the scale of the toad um, uh, spawn. You can see the, um, the size of the actual frog spawn um, to, the, um, to the right of the photograph. And the, the toad string is actually a lot smaller. And here again, uh, another close-up of some toad spawn. Another image showing frog and toad uh, spawn laid together. So you can see that quite often frogs and toads do coexist with frogs, um, with frogs laying first and then followed up by toads. So uh, let's have a look at toad and frog tadpoles. So although during their early stages, common frog and common toad tadpoles look fairly similar, once they start to grow, they become different in coloration. So frog tadpoles develop bronze spots, whereas toad tadpoles remain very dark, almost black, right through uh, the tad tadpole stage. So common um, frog tadpoles are usually larger than toads, but there is a great deal of vari variation in growth rates between individuals. So body size is not as reliable as distinguishing, at distinguishing the species. The behavior of common frog and toad tadpoles is also quite different. So common frog tadpoles tend to stay hidden among vegetation and detritus, and common toad tadpoles are distasteful to many predators and then swim around in open areas, sometimes in great numbers, forming shoals. So large numbers of black tadpoles swimming in shoals are likely to be common toad. Tadpoles usually spend between 15 and 25 weeks in the water. 
So this is another example of toad tadpole shawling. You can see uh, the pond at the back of the pond, a dark mass is on the foreshore. Here we go. On closer inspection, it revealed that there is a mass of thousands of toad tadpoles. So there is no mistake in here that the significant toad breeding pond. And this is a photograph of some of those uh, tadpoles all sort of shouldered together on the bank. On to adult toads. The common toad is quite a familiar animal. So there's little chance of confusing it with anything else. The only real challenge is distinguishing common toad tadpoles from those of the common frog when they are newly hatched, as we've already seen. But to recap, if you are unsure, toads have rough, warty skin, so are readily identifiable from common frogs. When moving, they tend to walk rather than hop like frogs. And they also have this wonderful bronze uh, eye with an elliptical uh, Pupil. Common frog is also a familiar animal, but unlike toads, they have smooth skin and are relatively athletic, leaping rather than walking like toads. This species shows a range of natural variation in coloration and markings. And unlike frog, uh, toad frogs, eyes are much rounder pupils. This is a male. So you can see it has quite a chunky forearm as well. Amphibians can show considerable variation in coloration and common frogs can be particularly variable. In a single population, there can be great variation in coloration and markings. Amphibians can also change coloration to a certain extent according to background illumination and brightness. So funny coloured frogs, especially from garden ponds, inevitably turn out to be common frogs. The common frog is a familiar animal. And the, and the only likely identification problems stemmed from unusual coloured marked individuals, as we've seen. There are some non-native frogs established in England. However, these non-native breeds breed in late spring, early summer and call loudly. Any frogs breeding early in the spring is almost certainly a common frog. Putting the two together, we can see the warty, chunky toad compared to the smooth skinned athletic frog on the right hand side here. Sometimes toads and frogs can get confused themselves. So here we have a common toad attempting to have a special cuddle with a common frog. The photo does however highlight the difference in eye coloration. The toad on top has a wonderful golden eye and very elongated pupil whereas the frog below has a very round pupil and looks somewhat startled given the circumstances. So these two frogs should have gone Specsavers. So for the spawn survey, we'd like volunteers to keep an eye out for signs of frogs, toads, whilst they're out and about. And I will go through the survey now in the next few slides. So the best time to survey is from February to May, although timing depends a lot on where you are in the country. For example, this year's spawn survey, we have had the first sightings on the 23rd of December uh, from the Scilly Isles. And this was followed up with a few um, um, records just after Christmas um, down in Devon, so down in the south. Now, if you have a local pond, it's always worth making several visits if possible throughout this time. There is a pond that I monitor every year for amphibians and frogs. And if I turn up in the f turn up first, uh, the frogs turn up first and then follow the, the, the toads follow. Now, I visited this pond in the second week in March and found lots of frog activity and large clumps of frog spawn but just a few hand, a handful of toads milling around in the water. But a week later, I have revisited and found that frogs have largely gone, but still lots of spawn, and the water was full of literally dozens of toads and lots of toad string. So basically, we're asking you, you to, um, if you've got a local pond, visit during the day, walk around the edge of the pond, searching for signs of amphibians, and record any signs of amphibians at the pond, count the number of frog spawn, and the presence of toad string. If you undertake a survey slightly after the main spawning period, you can also look out for tadpoles or newt larvae. 
when you approach a pond, it's amazing what you can see if you approach quietly. Or you can look under effusia, so logs and, and, and stones, um, which is how these two uh, toads were found. Search for signs of toads and frogs. You can record amphibians, any amphibians you see whilst undertaking the survey. Um, you might get a helping hand, but not always that helpful. Along this track, next to a reservoir breeding site, there were multiple toads and not frogs. But some kindly person decided to put a little note on to warn dog owners that there were frogs on the path. So moving on to our web pages. So all the information uh, you need can be found on our web page. Um, you can find this from the main main uh, page on our website, or you can put in a spawn Brex spawn survey, and it will come up uh, with with this uh, page. So the first button will take you to the recording form, which you can download. It's very simple, as you can see, and you can record basic details of what you see. So you can put your surveyor name um, and any any people that are, that are with you, an email address, the the pond name. Um, grid reference, the date, etc., and also what you see. So you can tick whether you've seen toad spawn, frog spawn, how many, etc. But the other thing we want to make note of is the group name, which is here on the form. So although this is a national survey, we are quite keen to find records of the Brex. So if you record, if you're in the Brex, if you can record the group name as the Brex, it just makes it a lot easier for us to find, pin down the records from the Brex area. So as I said, this is um, in conjunction with a national survey. So uh, sightings from all around the country will go into the same data portal. So it just makes it a little bit easier for us to identify um, sightings from the Brex area. Of course, if you're recording outside of the Brex and you're on this, um, you're listening to this, you can just uh, leave that blank. The second button uh, will take you to a very handy guide which, you, which can be downloaded. Now, this is courtesy of our friends at Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And it basically, it's, it's, it's the one document that you need to be able to um, actively identify uh, the amphibians. And I think it's got some reptiles on there as well, possibly. is um, another handy document on how to find a grid reference. If you are recording from a garden pond, you can use your postcode. But for ponds in the wider countryside, ideally, we would like a grid reference um, so we can pinpoint accurately where, the, uh, where the, the spawn was seen. And you can use this document to get onto grid reference finder. We can easily find a grid reference. Or you can use a handheld G. Yes, and a lot of mobile phones have apps now where you can you can get the grid reference um, from an app. For once you've recorded your findings on your recording form and you are back at home, you can then upload these onto the data portal, which is just below the resources buttons on the website. So again, you enter the basic information such as a name, email address, date of survey, grid reference. And again, please make sure if you are in the Brex area that you put the recording name as the Brex, which is here. And then you can obviously you 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 you, you enter the date of any uh, toad spawn scene, etc., number of frogs, etc. Be great if you could share your photos with us on social media, so on Twitter or Facebook. So here, this is the Twitter. So we have Pond River Stream, that's us, Freshwater Habitats Trust, the Brex Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership, the Brex um, LP, and that's me and Freshwater. If you don't do social media, it would be lovely, still lovely to see your photographs. So just send me an email and ping me your photographs. And if you do any social media, don't forget to hashtag spawn survey. So we've looked at frogs and toads. So let's now have a look at other amphibians and in particular newts. 
So there are three species of native newts in the UK. We have the great crested newt, which is the largest, the palmate newt, which is the smallest, and the smooth newt. When you start to identify adult, adult, adult newts, it's easier to focus on males during the breeding season when the development of courtly fe features makes them readily distinguishable. So this is a male smooth newt. The male in the breeding season sports a dorsal crest, which runs from the tip of the head uh, to the tip of the tail with no breaks. They grow to about 10 centimetres and the belly has an orange central band with black spots. They also have smooth skin, um, it looks sort of soft and velvety uh, during the terrestrial phase. So quite often people see the male smooth newt and think it's got a crest, therefore it's great crested newt. But as you can see, there, well, we'll see, we'll look at the great crested next. You can see there are quite different as well as being a lot smaller. Crested newt. As I said, this is the largest of our native newts and grows up to 16 centimetres in length. On paper, the male great crested newt has, has some characteristics in common with the smooth newt as I've said previously, that they both have crests and orange bellies with black spots. So, as I suggested before, this can lead to smooth newts being misreported as great crested newts. But on close inspection, the two species are very different in appearance. So, we saw the smooth newt previously, the crest went straight across the back with no gaps. Whereas on the male a crested newt here, you can see there is a gap at the base of the tail. And it's also a much more ragged than smooth newts. Other features of the male greater crested newt, it has a silvery white stripe along the side of the hind of the tail. And you can quite often see them when they're swimming around, you can just sort of see a white flash. And the female has an orange stripe along the hind end tail. Both have rough, dark, black granular skin, although it can look chocolate brown in torchlight. Uh, and yellow fingertips, so it looks like they've got yellow nail varnish on. So just to note that these newts were photographed while under anaesthesia uh, to photocopy them for a study on individuals within a population, and they were absolutely fine afterwards and released back to their pond. The palmate newt, in full breeding condition, the male palmate newt does not develop an, the obvious crest, as in the great crested and smooth newts, it has a ridge uh, running along its back and not a crest. It is also the smallest of our newts. It does, however, develop other features during the breeding season, which helps identification. So a, ta a tail filament and webbed um, hind feet. The body is also square shaped in cross section, but this uh, is not that obvious as the two other features. And finally, it also has a panel of orange and pink down the side of its tail, topped and bottomed by a row of black spots. The tail filament gives the appearance that the tip of the tail has been cut off and replaced with a fine thread. And the hind feet are webbed, and the webbing is a sooty black. But do pay attention, actually, the little tip at the end of the, fil the filament at the end of the tail can potentially get nibbled off by another creature, so you need to be aware of this. Um, note in the breeding uh, condition, male smooth newts develop flaps of skin around their toes and the hind feet, and extreme cases given the impression of webbing, um, as in the palmate newt. However, the hind feet of smooth newts do not take on the dark sooty coloration of palmate newts. And the obvious crest of a male smooth newt in peak condition should not allow any confusion of the two species. At the females. So what if you only find uh, one newt and it's a female? So as we've seen, GCN females are as striking as the males and are unlikely to be confused with other species. But female palmate newts and smooth newts can look very similar. If these newts were captured in the net, then close inspection, it is possible to see the, the, the differences, which we'll see on the next slide. 
that when newts are being observed by torchlight, identif identification may be less easy. So if only females are seen, then in this situation, they should be recorded as small newts. Males of the two species are easier to tell apart. One way to distinguish palmate and smooth newts is on the basis of the coloration of the throat. This is if you happen to have one in the hand, obviously. It is sometimes said that female smooth newts have spotted throats, while there are no spots on the throats of the palmate newts. Uh, this holds true in many cases, but some female smooth newts also do lack spots on the throat. Uh, it is more reliable to focus on the background coloration of the throat. So in the smooth newt, the background coloration is an off-white, often uh, khaki uh, yellow colour. In palmate newts, there is no pigmentation on the throat area, giving it a pink coloration due to the blood, ve blood vessels under the skin. So you can easily remember by saying smooth equals spotty or straw and palmate equals pink. Some newts you might see swimming around in the pond at torchlight. So what newt am I? Well this is a male and female and it is a smooth newt. So you can see here the male on the left hand side it's got a crest and it's a continuous crest all along the edge of its back. These newts, again, there's a male at the top and the female at the bottom. And these are palmate newts. And you can see the male, there's no crest. It does look quite boxy on this photograph. And you can see, not, not brilliantly, but you can see that the hind feet are very dark in coloration. The female before, a bit down below, this is gravid female, so it's probably about ready to lay eggs. And again, if you were seeing that on its own, you could easily mistake it for a, um, a smooth newt. But this chap here, pretty unmistakable, really. This is a great crested newt, and this is a male. So you can see here, it's got uh, the jagged crest on its back, which breaks at the base of the tail. You can see the, um, the white flash on its tail and its lovely yellow fingertips. photograph but uh, from the identification features so the yellow stripe at the base of the tail and the younger yellow fingertips and no crest so this is a female great crested newt. Moving on to newt reproduction so newts spend most of their life in terrestrial habitats returning to ponds to breed in the spring they tend to do their courting at night, which is why they can be seen swimming around more easily after dark. The females deposit their eggs singly, usually wrapping them around folded leaves. So here we see a female pal palmate newt, which is at the top, holding the leaf um, of some sort of water starwort water star in place around an egg she has just laid. She will remain in this position for several minutes, presumably waiting for the adhesive around the egg to set, holding the leaf in place. The egg wrecking behaviour probably serves to protect the egg from predation and UV, but not all eggs are wrapped up. Sometimes, especially when vegetation is scarce, eggs will be laid on any available surface, so twigs and pebbles, and they've even been seen to, to be laid on, on, on crisp packets and other um, sort of rubbish in the, uh, in the ponds. So egg laying, um, if newts are active in a pond, you will see signs of egg laying activity by the presence of these folded leaves, as you can see here. And the smaller newts often use a float grass. Uh, it's not a brilliant photograph, but you can probably see at the top, there are some of these uh, grasses that are folded over neatly. So the newts will lay their egg on the grass fold it over and then they might fold it over again and again so you might have multiple folds here. Looking at the new eggs 
in detail. So the two on the left hand side, that is a, a great crested newt egg. You can see it's very white. So this is folded over and then opened up. And then on the on the left hand side, on the right hand side, sorry, you can see the great crested newt is very white, uh, whereas a smooth stroke palmate newt is more sort of beigey brown. Again, if it's a small newt, it's very difficult to distinguish between a smooth and a palmate. So newts lay eggs on a variety of plants, but they do seem to have some preferences. So great crested newts tend to select larger leaved plants, which makes them easier to detect than those of the, of the other two species. In fact, it sometimes can be difficult to find eggs of the smaller newts. Uh, plants favoured by crested newts include float grass, gypsy wort, forget-me-not, water forget-me-not and water mint. However, other species will be used if these are not present. So if no aquatic plants are present, other material that may be used, as I said before, like plastic rubbish, um, terrestrial plants. So this is hawthorn at the bottom, which is obviously dipped into the pond edge and the newts have laid their eggs on, on them. So as we have seen, a, a good newt pond, it's often possible to see very obvious signs of newt breeding activity. Here we can see multiple eggs laid on one small piece of vegetation, the water forget-me-not. However, as GCN are a protected species, it is illegal to disturb them. So please avoid opening any folded leaves and yes, less you hold a GCN license. Once they are open, they tend not to stick back together. And although we are not specifically searching for GCN as part of this uh, survey, we would, however, be interested to know if any ponds may be present. So in this case, um, you could possibly take a photograph and send it over to me if you can see the egg um, through the gap. But please try and avoid opening um, them up to some extent because that will disturb the egg. On to newt larvae. This is a newly hatched GCN larvae. During the early development stages, newt larvae can be difficult to differentiate between. Newt larvae are well grown. It is relatively easy to distinguish great crested newt larvae from the other two species, although palmate newt and smooth newt larvae, again, cannot reliably be distinguished in the field. Um, at about the same time that the supply of newt eggs begins to tail off, larva could be sufficiently well grown to allow identification. So great crested newt larvae grow to a larger size than palmates and smooth up to about five centimetres um, compared with about three for the small newts. However, due to the prolonged period of egg laying in, in, in newt larvae can be a range of ages. So that small larvae may simply be more recently hatched. It's more reliable to identify great crested newt larvae on the basis of morphology and coloration. So the great crested newt larvae have very long toes, as you can see in this top photograph. And they have gills uh, which tend to arch back over the head and a broad spotty tail um, with a filament at the tip. They also have black ringed iris, so a bit like goth makeup. And they tend to float out in open water preying on water fleas, etc. And this behaviour, of course, makes them incredibly vulnerable, which is why they generally can't coexist with fish. As I mentioned previously, for this survey, we are not asking you to look specifically for newts, but just to record any that you may see. Newts are most active at night, so there is a good chance that you may not come across any during the daytime searches, but smooth newts can often be seen swimming around in ponds in the daylight, GCN less often. Again, as I've said before, GCN are a protected species, so you do need a license from Natural England to actively search for them. During the daytime search, you are most likely to come across eggs of signs of egg laying. Again, if you can, if you do see these, you can always send me a photograph. We'd like to thank Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, the Surrey Amphibian and Reptile Group and the New Forest Ecological Consultants, Fred Holmes and Phil King for the use of their resources and photographs used in this presentation. Uh, here is a, just a flyer, just um, 
promoting the spawn survey in the Brex. And if you click on the, um, go to the, the bitty link at the bottom, or if you click on the um, QR code, that will take you straight to the um, recording and resource uh, page on our website. But it's also easily found on our, um, on our webpage. 